welcome back, folks, to another week at Beyond the Trailer Park. Good to see everybody back. And we are down Miss Ashley again this week, but that is largely thanks to Hurricane Joaquin. Thanks a lot, Joaquin. Um, they were out at the Carolina Secular Conference this past weekend where Bobby C. was uh, delivering a uh, talk. And they kind of couldn't get out last night. So they are home now. Everything's cool. But it took them an extra day of staying in Myrtle Beach and uh, eight extra, well, eight hours instead of four hours to get home today. So they're a little exhausted. Um, Ashley said she might try and pop in, but I really don't think she's going to be able to stay away. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was texting her earlier, and the poor deer, she's thinking she's going to have to retire the flip-flops for the season, and she's really bummed about that, so, you know, sorry about that, Miss Ashley, but um, I'm thinking about putting a coat on when I go out, so, bleh. Speaking of uh, down south for me, uh, how's things over in Pennsylvania there, about? Well, I, 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 I just switched over to sweatpants weather for during the daytime, so it's getting a little cooler. Yeah. It is but we didn't we, we didn't get the rain that I thought we would from Joaquin, but we we had some but nothing spectacular, which I'm kinda glad of because I really don't like rain. Nothing to rain home about, I guess. That's good. Yeah. It's been wet here, but I mean all it just meant is that you know, hubby had to take the truck to work instead of the motorcycle. Yeah. So, yeah, a little damp, nothing too sh too bad, but it's been bloody cold. Today was pretty warm, but last yeah. few over the weekend, it was really damn cold, so. Well, and I actually had, had to shut my window, so. Oh, well, yeah, you know it's, it's getting cold, because as we all know, Beth uh, finds a little warm in her place there, so, yeah, if the window's closed, you know it's and, and Ashley asked me, hey, are you guys going to get snow soon? I'm like, no, you shut up. Just, no, stop it. Just, nah. <laughs> I swear, if I could, I would box up some and ship it to freaking Savannah for her. But we all know that's not going to work. So count yourself lucky, Miss Ashley, or you get a nice little box of snow heading your way as soon as we got some. Anyway... So this week, we are pleased to be joined by uh, David Rann, who uh, is involved with the Atheist Freethinkers out of Montreal. And uh, I had a, the pleasure of meeting David when he spoke at the non-conference back in August, and he was part of the panel on blasphemy. So welcome, David. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Beth. Mm. I'm pleased to be here. Excellent. And he's out of Montreal, so as you can see, he's got the uh, the sign en français behind him for uh, the group there. Thank you. Yes, uh, the name of our organization is Les uh, Repenseurs Athe, or uh, Atheist Freethinkers, based here in Montreal. So tell us a little bit about what uh, they do or what you do with them. Well, um, we have existed for about five years now. Um, we are a bilingual organization. Uh, we have a, a website in English and a website in French. Uh, our English website is uh, atheology.ca and the French is atheology.ca, the same, the same word but with IE after the G. Um, we uh, are affiliated with two international um, organizations with the uh, International Association of Free Thought and with AAI. And uh, we're also uh, participating in a local uh, secular coalition, which is called the Rassemblement pour la laïcité, or the, uh, uh, the uh, how would we say that in English, the, uh, well, the, the Coalition for, for Secularism here, here in Quebec. Uh, we uh, have uh, regular meetup groups. Um, we uh, have uh, members uh, across the country, but mainly mainly here in Quebec. And um, the most recent events uh, of importance here in Quebec would be 
uh, legislation that the government tried to put through recently, which uh, which would um, give the local uh, human rights commission the power to prosecute hate speech or speech inciting violence, and this was a yeah. a, a, a subject of concern to us because uh, it, it gave the human rights commission too many powers. Uh, hate speech was not well defined. And uh, it looked very much like uh, something that would be a, a, an anti-blasphemy law in practice, although that wasn't how it was phrased. And I, you know, that was one of the things that uh, that I discussed in my uh, remarks on the blasphemy panel at the uh, at the non-conference in Kitchener, where I met Deborah. Yes, and now a, a lot of people may not know, I, I have mentioned it kind of briefly on the show before, but we do actually have a blasphemy law on books currently. Um, can yes, we do. Yes, in the, in the, at the federal level, yes. There's a, a, a I forget, it's, I think it's Article 296 or something like that. It's, a, uh, it, it's against so-called blasphemous libel. It's rarely applied, but it's there on the books, and uh, there's the danger of it being used. And it's also a bad example for other countries. That's for right. example, if yeah. if we criticize Saudi Arabia, they can say, "Hey, you've got a blasphemy law too, Canada, uh, you hypocrites." That's, and you know, so to be consistent, we need to, we need to get rid of it. Because yeah. um, go ahead, Jess. I was going to say the the whole thing that you brought up with Saudi Arabia criticizing that actually. <laughs> has come up. I've seen in, uh, a couple of news articles floating across my screen in the last couple of days that someone had commented, and they're like, "Well, you have nothing to say. You have, you know, your blasphemy laws." And they're like, "What?" So a lot of you don't even know you guys even have that. I know. And uh, like now, uh, we've had Sandy Donaldson on the show, and and we didn't really talk about that law then because it was pre-conference and we didn't want to give anything away but uh, I was talking to Sandy about it over lunch at the conference and he was saying you know the law as it's written right now is basically unenforceable because uh, how did he say it was you had to if you had a in good conscience um, a, a sincere belief that it was true or something like it was really weird how it was worded that it really wasn't enforceable and I know some people well if it's not enforceable then who cares and that's that's the point right there is it doesn't matter if it's not enforceable some you know uh, uh, fascist regime like Saudi or Bangladesh or somebody's gonna come along and go well you shut the hell up because you've got a lot too so you know we'll yes, we'll yes. Execute. It's just a bad example. Yeah. Well, what, what it does, too, is when you have a law, quote, still on the books, even though it is unenforceable, and this actually happened, and I've brought it up before, when uh, Whitman was uh, elected governor in New Jersey, they actually had on the books still valid law. It was still valid, too. Um, no women can be governor, basically. They had to actually re go back in between the time she was elected to inaugurate her inauguration and rewrite the law or she so that's what it, it creates a log jam when you have stuff like that on the books well yeah because if you if you had to do something like that in an emergency situation that means something more legitimate in the big picture is going to get pushed aside so that they can call an emergency session and deal with this whatever stupid law it is. So it's a legitimate, excuse me, legitimate problem. And so this new law um, that they're proposing would uh, criminalize, quote, hate speech. Well, it, 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 it's, not, uh, it's not criminal legislation, it's not a criminal court, it's, at the, it's at the provincial level only, and it gives powers to the human rights commission. So, can you hear me correctly? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. Um, uh, it, would, it would allow the, uh, the Human Rights Commission to uh, investigate complaints that are anonymous, but without protecting the anonymity of the person accused, uh, 
they could levy huge fines. Uh, they would be keeping a list of guilty parties uh, displayed publicly on the internet. Uh, it, it's a bit uh, like uh, denouncing your neighbor kind of thing, uh, but it doesn't involve uh, like criminal sanction, like uh, prison or anything like that. It's just a provincial law. But um, there was a massive outcry against it, and at parliamentary hearings uh, to discuss legislation, uh, almost all groups opposed it, except for a few uh, fundamentalist is, uh, Muslim groups who liked it, because it would protect their religion against tr criticism, against uh, people saying not things about Prophet Muhammad or about, about Islam, and, and there were some uh, Muslim groups who some fairly right-wing uh, fundamentalist Muslim groups who liked it, but everybody else, everybody, uh, all secularists uh, criticized it, feminists criticized it, um, and um, the government finally got the message and they're going to rewrite it, but we don't know what's going to come of that. They're going to uh, apparently get rid of the worst of it, but uh, we don't know what that means yet. What makes them think that we need another law in that line anyway? Well, uh, I think that it's coming from a lot of pressure from uh, Muslim fundamentalists and Islamists who are putting pressure on governments to, uh, to prevent criticism of Islam. Unfortunately, uh, they seem to be getting special treatment. Um, uh, for example, uh, the, the, at the same time that, that this new law was introduced, there was an action plan uh, that the same government introduced to supposedly to fight radicalization. That is uh, the radicalization of people who uh, become, uh, who decide to leave the country and, and fight, uh, or, or maybe not leave the country, but fight uh, for, uh, for you know, Islamism. And their solution, or in this action plan, what they said that the cause of it was Islamophobia, uh, prejudice against Muslims. But it doesn't make any sense. But obviously, the, the the cause of people getting radicalized is the Islamist propaganda itself, and not. Uh, um, I guess my audio is being a little wonky. So I'm just gonna pop out and right back in. So carry on. I'm just gonna pop out for a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, go go ahead with what you're saying about the radicalization. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the 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 action plan that the Quebec government introduced uh, to fight radicalization blamed radicalization on prejudice against Muslims and not against Islam uh, and and did not blame it on Islamism, which is. Which it's pretty backwards. It's pretty clear that the, uh, the uh, cause of radicalization, radicalization is the Islamist propaganda. propaganda. And if there is prejudice against Muslims, Muslims that's, a, that's result a result of a legitimate fear, which is then being uh, generating prejudice uh, based on the fear of uh, Islamist uh, excesses. So uh, they, they've got things backwards. Do I still have better? It sounds like, too, like, as far as with those that are traveling over, like, you know, the, the kids we're hearing about that, you know, are becoming, quote, radicalized, to borrow the term, and then going over and saying, oh, yeah, we want to fight in the jihad. But to me, it, I mean, I've read a couple of the stories surrounding it, and, and some of them are really heartbreaking uh, with, with these kids that are getting radicalized. It's just like... I, I don't think they have any freaking clue what they're even getting themselves into. And like, they, you're, like you're saying, I mean, they have, I mean, it's like they have no clue what Islam is all about. They, because they don't, people don't realize that Islam is not just a religion. It is also a political ideology. It is yes. a true theocratic, uh, theocratic, uh, I guess, religion, for lack of a better word. I mean, the, it's a religion. It's a yeah, religion. Yeah, it's like, and, and I don't think I don't think these kids that are getting sucked in realize this. I mean, well, the recruiters. And do I sound better now? By the way, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. The the people um, that are doing the recruiting over there. I read stories where journalists have posed as um, mainly young women at this point, but they've mm -hmm. for whatever reason. I, one story I read, 
she wasn't meaning to pose as a young um, Muslim girl, but somehow she got in touch with this ISIS guy and decided that she would see what she could find out and pretended to be a, a young Muslim girl. And they just talk up all this glory stuff and, you know, you're going to have a, a wonderful, handsome husband who's a respected soldier who's going to fight for Allah. And, you're you know, you're going to have... Um, you know, nice home, and he's going to take care of you, and all of this crap. And they get over there, and they find out that, you know, if they they get married, they're lucky. They're basically expected to to start pumping out babies the second they get there, and, and they're going to get locked up in a, in a hut somewhere, and, and that's it, you know. Yeah. They don't have a... And the boys that, that go over there... Um, my friend Paul does a, a show called Chronify Me, where he um, he talks about Islamic issues and whatnot. And that lady, I don't know if you're familiar, David, the lady out of, uh, I think it was Calgary, whose son actually was killed fighting for ISIS. And uh, Paul interviewed her. And, you know, her son actually had um, mental uh, issues, um, I think. I think, I can't remember what his diagnosis was, but um, she said initially him um, following Islam had a calming effect on him and it helped him focus and, and sort of get his stuff together, but he ended up um, strictly due to transportation issues going to a mosque that was full of radicalizers. And she said for him, what they did was they convinced him that he would be fighting to protect women and children and that it was this noble thing that he could do because she said he was a very caring and and um, affectionate young man who really cared about vulnerable people and so that's what they told him they said you're gonna go over and you're gonna protect women and children in the name of Allah and you're going to be you know exalted by Allah and all of this crap and he went over and got killed what does that sound like to you Deb or Ann David what well, you just described well it sounds to me like they're exploiting the weaknesses of the, of the young people and telling them what they want to hear and uh, and who else does that? Well, uh, all, all, all religions do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, this, this lady's lost her son, and there's all kinds of other young people from all over the world that have been suckered into it. And once they get over there, what are they going to do? You know, like they're, they're hardly going to say, oh, gee, you know what? It's really, you know, not for me. They're stuck because yeah. the, the fanatics over there are going to kill them at the first sight of, of weakness or, or indecision. And so you end up with kids who are willing to, to shoot people and do all kinds of horrible things to prove that they aren't having second thoughts, which, of course, they are. You know, it's this, this vicious circle. And, and also, uh, if they are uh, shot for because they're trying to change their minds, that's uh, that is in line with uh, the religion because Islam condemns apostasy. Once mm -hmm. you're in, you are not allowed to leave. It's a right. it's a heinous sin to leave Islam. It's a yeah. one-way ticket. And uh, in some countries, uh, being an apostate is punishable even by death. Absolutely, and look at like Ali Rizvi. He's like, I can never go back to Saudi because I'm an outspoken atheist who's been on the CBC. You know, there's no way I can go back to Saudi. I'd be arrested the second I stepped off, but probably before I got off the plane. You know, <laughs> and, and he grew up there, so he can never go back to you know where part of his homeland because of that. There's other people like. Um, um, somebody that we're acquainted with in Nigeria, Mubarak Bala, who his own family threw him in a mental institution when he told them that he was an atheist. And it was only, well, two things. 
he, he a sympathetic aunt gave him a phone that he could access Twitter on, and he tweeted out to uh, uh, all the atheists that he knew, just let people know what has happened. He wasn't even asking to be rescued, or he was just like, just make sure my story gets out. Uh-huh. And what's really lucky for him um, was that the hospital that he had been sent to, it wasn't just a mental health hospital, it was an all-encompassing hospital, and they had um, a, a staff strike, and they didn't have enough staff to keep the um, mental patients in that weren't violent, so that's the only reason he got out at that time. Uh-huh. Wow. And he's been hiding in Nigeria ever since. Um, he just messaged me a couple of weeks ago, um, Actually, it's kind of disappointing. He had been offered a scholarship at Stanford. He's already got an engineering degree, and they were going to take him at Stanford, and he, he wasn't able to raise the money to get out. But he just messaged me about three weeks ago and said that he had a, a, a good job in Nigeria and that the sort of the heat was off for now and that he was felt reasonably safe where he was. So... There's that, and, and my my sort of pet thing right now is is Bangladesh. Like that, mm-hmm. that's just. I, yes, there's been a lot of violence against atheists in Bangladesh. Yes. Absolutely, and, and my thing is, what I do every damn day on Facebook, in a lot of cases, is a lot more harsh than what any of those guys ever said. You yeah, know? and, and, and rape, uh, you know. yeah, and rape. Go ahead, Beth. Oh, I was just gonna say it was it was actually really through you that I started paying a little bit more attention to it because sadly I always had the uh oh it doesn't affect me attitude. You know, I mean I paid attention and, and, and you know, my empathy you know, yada yada yada, but I think it was actually it was the Bangladesh killings that really, really kinda slapped me in the face because you know, here are people who are just writing words yes. and religious fuck cards. If you, you know, are just they're going ape shit over words. Yeah, it and just it blows what, my mind. And what makes it even worse is that the the police often sympathizes with the, uh, the those who are persecuting them. Yes, yes. and and that I, in fact I just posted. Yeah. Was it last week? I think an article. Uh, I don't know if it was with Bangladesh or India. Um, they were basically. I think it was Bangladesh because they, the, the the police basically told, you know, after they they filed the. Was they, it was no, don't was it Bangladesh? Okay, you know, was, don't write what you write. It was Niloy who was killed in his own home. They actually stormed his own apartment and macheted him to death in his child's bedroom. Um, I actually looked at the pictures, and it, it, there's, mm-hmm. like, boys on the bed. And um, he had been, because these these freaks are, are threatening them be, beforehand, and Niloy actually went to the police and said, look, I'm being threatened that I'm next, and they're going to come to get me, and they basically said, well, then don't write that stuff. Yeah. Um, you're aware of the, uh, the the open letter that the IHEU uh, prepared yeah. and sent to the uh, the president and prime minister of Bangladesh, and uh, there were many organizations that co-signed it, and, including us. So uh, there was a, a a very large worldwide uh, protest against that. Yeah. But uh, we have to keep the pressure up. Well, so well, no, the, well go, go ahead, Deb. I was just going to say, the sad thing with a lot of these places, and Saudi is the worst one, when, you know, uh, groups of the world come together and say, what the hell is wrong with you? You know, they just dig their heels in deeper. Well, that's, you know, that's our country, and that's how we are, and we're, you know. Uh, like, Saudi sent that um, press release out, what was it, two or three months ago, that yeah. basically said... It's our fucking country, and you keep your noses out of it, you know, piss off. <laughs> and they don't care. They, though they, at Saudi at least, doesn't give a shit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 
don't get me started on Saudi. We'll be here all night. <laughs> well, I was gonna say it's kind of Bangladesh is kind of confusing because they actually are a quote secular government, but their country is literally being overrun by Islamic radicals, and I just find it funny, especially not funny, haha, but odd uh, because they they just released the quote so-called hit list. And what people might not realize is some of the individuals on that list are not just in Bangladesh. Mm. There are writers in France, they are writers in, e in the UK, some writers here in the US, and some writers over uh, up in Canada. Oh, so it's I like, he, he, yeah, they're... Mm -hmm. Are so they like, hmm? writers of Bangladeshi origin, or are they just yes. going... Yes, yes. Oh. Yeah, so I think you and I know who might be on that list. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, it, and the whole attitude, like one article I read, which I didn't post, was basically, eh. It's like, how can people be that dense? Yeah. And that's what gets me is that if... Because that that's a real fear for expat Bangladeshis is that some of these folks are going to come over here and track them down and machete them in you know the streets of New York or Toronto or whatever, and that's where I say if they can do that, what happens when they run out of Bangladeshis to kill? And you know here's me uh, and I mean I I'm small potatoes but you know people like me that are out on on social media and YouTube and wherever every damn day and nothing says that they aren't gonna go um, hit happy and and start trying to pick us all off so that's that's to me is why it's so important to be vocal about that kind of thing and and the the anti hate speech and this Islamophobia shit plays right into it Yes, it, it does. It, it, it indicates uh, we, we must not forget that uh, there are real good reasons why people fear uh, maybe not all Islam, but at least the radical elements, and, and that fear is completely irrational. And uh, the word phobia doesn't apply. A phobia means an irrational fear. Being afraid of Islamic fundamentalists is, is, is totally rational. Mm -hmm. it is. And, and uh, Ali actually said that um, when he was here and he said that at the conference last year was, I have legitimate reasons to fear I I Islamists because I'm an apostate and they are scripturally justified in killing mm -hmm. me. Exactly, exactly. These people are dangerous. Um, recently, just a few days ago, there was uh, an event that happened here in Quebec where uh, one of the political parties in the National Assembly in Quebec City got a motion passed by the entire assembly uh, denouncing Islamophobia. And uh, this is a very retrograde step because uh, the very concept of Islamophobia is, is, is something that uh, is promoted by Islamist fundamentalists to... to uh, to basically stifle criticism of their ideology. And uh, it's this very sort of uh, well-meaning but not very intelligent uh, left-wing uh, leader, left-wing member of the National Assembly who got this motion passed, uh, which, is, uh, which is really kind of an insult to everybody's intelligence uh, and, and, a, and a gift to Islamists. Yes, and 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 I know I keep mentioning Ali, but this is this is like my favorite thing of his. His quote of his was, "It's an afflectation." <laughs> oh, the Ben Affleck offense on the uh, yes. Meyer show, yeah. And that's where that that shit comes from. And I get where people are saying we shouldn't be racist against um, um, Muslims, but well, that's 
God. Islam is not a race, so the word that's, doesn't apply. <laughs> that's what I say is like, what race is Islam? There's there's white Islamists. There's there's Asian. You know, like look at um, Malaysia. That's like hugely heavy in in uh, Islam. There's. And, there's also the fact that the, that moderate is uh, moderate Muslims are uh, targets of uh, uh, targets of the, the the danger that the Islamists pose to everyone, uh, yes. and and that uh, to to say that there's prejudice against Muslims is to put all Muslims in the same bag as if the the moderates and the and the radical fundamentalists were all together the same, and they're not. A, you know, they're all there are many differences. And there are there are Muslims here in Quebec who uh, who are for secularism. There's a, an organization of uh, North Africans for secularism, uh, yeah. which uh, exists uh, here in Quebec, and it's a member of the of the Rassemblement pour, the, pour la laïcité, which we're a member of as well. And they denounced uh, the the this motion that was put forward by the MNA, uh, this motion against so-called Islamophobia, because uh, as 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 people who are from a Muslim background but are not uh, radical Muslims, they they know they they have many of them have suffered under, for example, the uh, the Algerian. Uh, situation in the 1990s when Islamists were killing people. The moderate Muslims have suffered greatly uh, because of Islamists. Absolutely. I mean, even like after 9-11, anybody who was brown was getting targeted, whether you were even a Muslim or not. And the Sikhs. Were, yeah, the Sikhs were big. And, and they're, still, they're still, now they're actually here. I mean, there was a couple of stories that came out that now they're just being targeted for being Sikhs, which no, really is bothersome. I mean, I mean it, it's the extreme, and there was only, but it basically it came down to the, the the victim was targeted specifically, not because he looked like a Muslim, but because he was a Sikh, because ignorance of what Sikhs believe. Yeah, because I mean, as far as religions goes, not too terrible. <laughs> You know, like it's it's marginally tolerable as far as religions go. I, I mean, I'm I'm anti theism of, of all stripes, but uh, mm. you know, if you gotta if you gotta deal with one, Sikhism is one that I'd be more inclined to deal with. But it's uh, you know, it, it, it's getting out of hand sometimes. Where on both sides, because you get the people who are like any anybody who's who looks like they could possibly be brown is is a terrorist, and then mm -hmm. you get the other side with, you know, if you uh, mention that anything that Islam does might not be the best thing, then you're a bigot. It's it's like you know, I, I, get, I think the um, the prejudice against Muslims is probably greater in the United States than in Canada. Because of the strength of the Christian fundamentalists, mm -hmm. whereas religious bigotry, uh, uh, like the competition between the two uh, religions, uh, increases the prejudice against Muslims. I assume that's uh, what's going on. Uh, people here are—I uh, don't think they're particularly prejudiced at all. Uh, I think their their fears. When they do have fears, are 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 based on reality, and yeah. uh, I don't think there are a lot of cases of uh, of real, you know, outrageous uh, bigotry and racism, uh, which you do can tend to get when uh, when you have a conflict between two radical religious groups, like between you know fundamentalist Christians and fundamentalist Muslims, for example. Well, I, I, I know just the other day, and I believe it was in Georgia, but don't quote me, they, there was a group who are pretty pissed off because in a, I think it was junior high, maybe younger, uh, they were learning about Islam in a purely historical context about what they believe, yada, yada. I mean, it was age appropriate, you know, it was okay. where it should be. And of course, you know, people are 
blowing their gaskets. Oh, they're teaching Islam. No, no, they're teaching about. There's a difference. About Islam, not teaching Islam. And they're just, yeah, they're going like totally loopy over it. And that, I think that's the difference. I don't hear stuff like that coming out of Canada. Well, I, probably similar to the people who think that, uh, you know, yoga is demonic. <laughs> yes. Well, you, well, there was that whole case, what was it, last <laughs> year before? They were trying to teach yoga. Uh, just yeah. yoga, not the spiritual Hindu Hindu religion behind it, but just the physical moves, and they went ballistic. Yeah, because because it comes from Satan. Ah, and if, yeah. you, if you even think about doing yoga, Satan's gonna get in your brain, man. Don't you know it? Well, I know. I think it was Murph. I might be wrong, but. I know there was a, a case that came up again about a year and a half ago. Uh, they were using yoga to um, treat uh, PTSD with some of our veterans, and they were having a really good result with it. And I don't remember all the details, but some Christian group went totally ballistic that basically that they're they're trying to satanize. Our, our, our military troops because they're teaching them yoga and it's like seriously and then they'll probably <sighs> how because um, the is I think the VA is taxpayer funded isn't it yes yeah. yeah so they're gonna have a cow like oh my god the VA is paying for satanic yoga and, and and again all they were teaching was basically the the meditation and the movements and it's just <sighs> They In should other just words, call it exercise. exercise. Yes, yeah, exercise. Just, just call it freaking exercise. Drop the yoga for now. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's it's that overreactive crap mm -hmm. that, that really causes problems. But like I say, you know, we're seeing the opposite on the left now with this Islamophobic shit, and <sighs> it's so frustrating because they're not. They're not even looking at what they're saying, or they're not even looking at the impact that the, those kinds of ideas are going to have. All they're really looking at is the warm and fuzzy of being, you know, I'm being inclusive and I'm not, I'm making absolutely sure no one can call me a bigot because, you know, I'm just going to go the opposite direction. And it's like, it doesn't work, people. Like, you have to... There has to be some, you have to get your hands a little bit dirty in order to make some progress, you know? Well, you have to retain your critical faculties. <laughs> you have to retain your brain and, and use it. This makes me think of the, uh, I don't know if you want to get into it, but the whole issue of the kneecap that's come up in the federal election campaign here in Canada. And I was uh, also going to touch on um, the... Now, I don't remember if it actually got made a law, but they were proposing in Quebec to um, ban all um, overt religious symbols in, in the public, like with public servants and whatnot. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yes, we they were. And uh, we supported that. As a matter of fact, that is the uh, origin of this coalition uh, for secularism here in Quebec, was to support that legislation. Because... Um, it would have uh, kept religious symbols out of the public service, but it was very controversial, yes. So did, that was passed then or no? No, no, it was not passed. And uh, what happened was that uh, uh, the government which proposed the legislation called an election. They only had a minority government at the time, and they wanted to get a majority to help them pass the legislation and any other legislation they had, and they lost the election. Yeah. So uh, and, and now we have uh, a, a, um, a government which is um, very sympathetic to to the fundamentalist Muslims. I find oh, yeah. the the current government is the one that uh, that proposed this uh, law, which uh, would uh, which would uh, against hate speech. Uh, you know. 
because that's I, I couldn't figure out how we went from let's get rid of overt religious symbols in the public sector to hey let's enshrine Islamophobia. Like, uh, well, what happened is that there was an election and the, the secularist side lost, and uh, the woman Françoise David is her name who proposed this uh, uh, this motion against Islamophobia. She was. She's with one of the parties that opposed the charter that, uh, that was secular, the secularism charter. Um, so uh, it's not really surprising. Um, and just to put it in perspective, um, last year I was I went back to college for a bit and I was doing a human resources program. And in one of our classes, we were doing um, it was it was a facilitation. So we were trying to formally um, structure a discussion and one person was supposed to sort of lead the discussion and, and it was an exercise in how to do that and ahead of the time everyone else in the group had pulled roles out of a hat so somebody was supposed to be you know uh, not doing anything and somebody was supposed to be trying to take over and stuff like that and the one that I got was um, something like being the contrary, like always trying to be contrary. And that was the subject, was this legislation, um, because you could pick pretty much whatever you wanted to talk to. Well, it just so happened that I opposed it anyway, or, or sorry, supported it. They were talking about being against it. And so I was throwing out my points in, in support of it. And the looks I got from the other people in the group, you would have thought that I wanted, I suggested we have a baby barbecue. Um, uh, that was pretty much the mentality of those who opposed it. Uh, they, they vilified and uh, demonized we who supported the legislation, and it was really very, very ugly. Very ugly. And, and the only reason that... I didn't end up being like completely vilified by the entire class was I was like I got the thing that says I'm supposed to be contrary and and they, they kind of went oh okay as long as you're making it up and I'm like <laughs> um, you can just oh. believe you like at this point so, as, so so tell me Deborah what was your opinion of the you, you're talking about the the Quebec Charter proposed yes, by the PQ I, right Fully in support of it. Um, I don't okay. think that anyone in the public sector needs to be flaunting religiosity in any way. If you're working for the public, and and we're talking like largely government provided jobs, right? And and things like teachers as well, and that's that's board of education. So those types of jobs, there's no reason for you to be sitting there with a giant cross you know, what would Jesus do or, or anything like that. If you want to wear your little cross that Grandma gave you at your confirmation, I'm sure that's fine, but there's no re need or, you know, the, the, the big shirt that says Jesus loves you or any of that crap. There's no re reason to have any of that, and I fully supported it, and I, I'm kind of disappointed to find out what happens. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you supported it, and it was a big disappointment. Uh, it was in April of 2014 when uh, the, you know, the, the government was defeated and so the legislation died. But nothing has been resolved. Uh, the, the popu it's still very popular among the population uh, here in Quebec. Uh, there's still a great deal of support for such an idea, but no such legislation on the books for now. So did they lose the election if people were in support of it? That's what I well, know. because because uh, there was more than one issue on the table. It's complicated. Well, I mean, uh, the the uh, uh, the party that that proposed the secular charter also promotes uh, Quebec sovereignty or Quebec yeah. independence, so however you want to uh, phrase it. And so that was highly uh, highly controversial. And the two issues got mixed up. And uh, there are some so-called secularists who refuse to support the charter because anything that comes out of that political party has to be evil because there's so much hatred for them. Uh, the Parti Québécois. Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, I consider that to be a totally irrational attitude because a good idea is a good idea no matter who comes up with it. Yeah. Uh, and it was a, good, a very good idea. 
uh, imperfect. It didn't go far enough, actually. Uh, it didn't uh, change uh, fiscal conditions. It didn't. It didn't uh, uh, remove the fiscal advantages that uh, the churches have, and that's a major. That was a major failing of the legislation. It didn't go far enough, but what it did do was good. Well, I now you know I've always kind of thought that the the idea of you know tax the hell out of the churches and make them pay up like everybody else, but. My friend Dave has a, a, a counter thought to that, and, and I'm sort of reevaluating that because mm -hmm. um, yeah, Beth knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, because it's making me reevaluate as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and his point is that if you continue to let them have tax breaks, they are still legally prevented from politicking. And even though they do, if they get caught, they can get fined out the wazoo a lot more than their taxes might be, and so mm. I'm I'm sort of on the fence with it now. Oh, that... I, I I I think that they already uh, managed to get their point of view out. Uh, even, right. uh, no, I, I think that they should be taxed like everyone else, and let, you know let the chips fall where they may. And if they if they they try to promote their uh, point of view. Then we we have to you know prov you know provide our counter point of view, but they should be taxed like everyone else. Uh, I I don't see a, I don't think it's a good idea to let them continue having that fiscal advantage at all. Okay. No, I, it just made me think. I haven't I haven't really decided if I I I think it might be to like between here in the states uh, versus Canada. Um, uh, that the the churches, I mean, this is just my perception, so correct me if I'm wrong. The churches don't seem to be as vocal with the politicking in the pulpit as down here. Is that true? Uh, uh, yes, mm -hmm. with the possible exception of of a few Islamic fundamentalists. Yes. Yeah, yeah. See, I I think for us here in the states, like they're already doing it. You know, and 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 this was the the fight that the FFRF took up was that, uh, and why they went after the IRS was that the IRS is not carrying their ball; they're not prosecuting where they should be. Uh -huh. And I, you know, this way it gives us, you know, okay, if we keep it where it's at right now with 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 no taxes, we at least have a way to rein them in down here where it is an issue. If we remove the tax claim and let them politic from the pulpit, we have no way to rein them in. And there, and the problem is, if here some of these churches are actually behind some of these religious liberty bills, uh, especially if the the whole debacle in Houston um, when Houston had the uh, uh, their uh, do, uh, do not discriminate bill. There was, if I remember correctly, three or five churches that raised the stink with this, uh, the hero bill down in Houston. So if you, if you, you know, it's it's such a tangled web. So in other um, words, um, Dave's idea might have more merit in an American climate than in a. Canadian climate. That's that's possible. I'm not as familiar with the with the American legal situation. Uh, I would. I should also point out that you know uh, uh, there is uh, there are also some uh, Christian fundamentalists who are in Canada who are similar to the American variety. I'm thinking of the ones who tend to back the current government, and they also uh, stick up their ugly heads from time to time. So it's not just the it's not just the Islamists. <laughs> We've been doing. Yeah. Uh, uh, a segment lately now actually this week it's Beth's turn but I've been doing one where um, another friend of ours named Dave, see I told you we know far too many Daves, um, uh, but a friend of ours in Ottawa um, he and I had been and chatting on Facebook for a while and uh, he gave me shit one day because he's like you don't know enough about Canadian politics you know too much about American I'm like yeah, yeah you're right so he and I and Beth teamed up, and I went through and researched all of the currently registered federal parties to see what was out there. And we've been um, when going through uh, and highlighting, depending on the party, because some of them are kind of small, you know, highlighting one to two or three at a show. So we did um, 
discuss the Christian Heritage Party at one point. <laughs> well, they're menu school, aren't they? I mean, they're yeah, yeah, they are. But my and my uh, my remember my notes on them because um, I would go through and sort of do some key points about them. And my notes said um, the uh, should be renamed the Christian Persecution Party. <laughs> That's because like they have a persecution complex, or yes, because they want they want to persecute others, or both. both I think, <laughs> I think so their platform sounded like oh us poor Christians all, oh. and, and I loved it. Their one of their premises was that uh, freedom comes from Christianity, and I was like, wow, you're deluded, bud. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, and we, I, my favorite one, even though they're not um, registered anymore, was the Natural Law Party. So we uh, we did <laughs> highlight them uh, about three weeks ago. That was that was our quite flying fun. yogis. Yes, the flying yogis. <laughs> the yogis on a trampoline, I think, is what they really were. Were they not? Oh, no, that's it. They weren't even like they were bouncing up and down. But uh, while well, our our American friend Dave was with us on the show that day, and he's like. They're not flying, they're butt hopping because they're like boing, 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 boing. It was yes. weird. C to think that those guys were actually running, you know, in the federal election back then is like, wow. I wish they'd bring back the rhinos. I would love to vote for the rhinos. I, think, I, right? I, think, there, I think there are a few rhino candidates still around, but I'm not sure. Well, they are still registered, but uh, in my writing, it sucks for anything um, original. Um, we we basically have the big four plus the two varieties of communists, and that's it. Okay. Oh, I never get a chance to even consider, like, uh, you know, a couple of years ago or the last time around, I would have voted marijuana party just for the hell of it, but we didn't have a candidate of them either, so... This time around, I'm, st I'm I'm sorry, I can't bring myself... Actually, that was last week's show. We did the, the Marxist-Leninists and the Communists. I'm like, yeah, I can't bring myself to vote for them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing what actually is out there when you start to look at it. The, I didn't realize we still had 18 parties registered federally currently. That many, okay. Yeah, there was some that I'd never heard of at all. Um, there was, uh, what did I do with my notes now? There was one out of Quebec, and I can't re remember the name of it off the top of my head, but there, oh, here we go. Here's my notes here. Force a démocratie. Um, yeah, that's all it is. Force a démocratie. And basically, they're like, Canada craps on Quebec all the time, and we want to promote the interests of Montreal and the Lower St. Lawrence Valley, and that's it. So they're right up your alley, <laughs> but they don't care about anybody else. <laughs> well, it sounds like they're supporting just part of Quebec, but yeah. that's all. That's all it is. And I, I couldn't even figure out. Uh, and they only had a French website, no English website, because they don't care about English. And I couldn't figure out for sure that they were separatists, but judging from the rest of their stuff, I'm guessing they probably are. That was one I'd never heard of before. Force a Democratie. And that we had the Animal Alliance Environment Voters Party of Canada. Did not know about them either. Okay. And all their whole platforms all about animals. So, you know, forget economics or foreign policy. It's, you know, protecting animals, which is noble. But, you know, there's kind of more to it than that. Yes. So what kind of uh, a competition is it looking at out your way? Well, there's uh, there are the three main parties plus the uh, Black Québécois. Yes. The, the, the and uh, there are some, I believe, some uh, Green Party candidates, but I don't think they're running in every riding. But I'm not sure of that. Yeah, your your sort of fourth would be the block, whereas yes. here it's the Greens. Right. Right. Yeah, we've covered the block on the show, so um, regular listeners should have at least some clue what we're talking about with the block. Okay. Um, 
Do we do we want to get into the niqab in the federal uh, campaign now that we're talking about federal political parties? I can do that. I was just thinking it's 25 after. Why don't we take a break and do best segment? And everybody can do bio break and whatnot. You have about uh, 12 minutes or so, and then we can come back and talk about uh, kneecaps. Or I have to say, I was talking to a friend of mine, um, one of the local atheists on Messenger before the show, and he's like, he's like, my wife got mad at me when I said they look like ninjas. I'm like, well, they kind of do. <laughs> Bad ninjas, because. All of that fabric's gonna get stuck in everything. Like you're not gonna be very stealthy like that, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's my horribly politically incorrect um, statement for the evening. So let's go take a look at what Havoc and Chaos has to say, and we'll be back in roughly twelve minutes. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Havoc and Chaos Live. We look at some of the batshittery we call news and the pals, pundits, and other off-the-wall people, myself included, who claim to know what is really going on in our world. I am an atheist, a lesbian, and I have bipolar disorder. Therefore, hate of any kind is not welcome in my world. I am opinionated, and my impulse control went out the window three months ago. So, I say what I feel. In other words, stupid smart people piss me the fuck off. Be forewarned. I am highly excitable, and if you are easily offended by four-letter words or longer, you may want to go listen to something else. I wasn't going to do this to myself so soon, but we're going to revisit the Kim Davis affair. Sort of. If you remember, in my first contribution to the fracas, I talked a bit about special meaning, or Christian exceptionalism, the I'm special mentality. Today, I want to look at one specific argument that has been flaunted in Davis's defense. Michael, Dred Scott decision of 1857 still remains to this day the law of the land, which says that black people aren't fully human. Does anybody still follow the Dred Scott Supreme Court Well, it, the, the Dred Scott decision was overturned by the 13th Amendment. Now, I'm certain the various analyses that I have read prior for what I will call part one have been correct, that Dred Scott was overturned by the 13th and 14th Amendments. So, no... It's no longer the law of the land. And as I said previously, Huckabee was an ass, constitutionally speaking, inciting it as support for his cause. But something's been nagging at me. I know the Reich is getting desperate. They are embracing scary levels of radicalism to seize power in any way they can. So, is Huckabee just pandering to his base, or... Is he really that stupid? Now, personally, I think I already know the answer, but it's probably not what you may think, especially if one takes into account the statement in June regarding the King ruling concerning Obamacare, the other thorn in the right side. Today's King v. Burwell decision, which protects and expands Obamacare, is an out-of-control act of judicial tyranny. Our founding fathers didn't create a do-over provision in our Constitution that allows unelected Supreme Court justices the power to circumvent Congress and rewrite bad laws. The Supreme Court cannot legislate from the bench, ignore the Constitution, and pass yada yada yada. Now, notice his verbiage, the talking points of the right. That's what is bothersome. So let's take a little side trip, shall we? Just for a moment. Nestled in an article by contributing writer Danielle Allen over at WAPO is a discussion of the underlying issues of both Dred Scott and the Oberfeld's ruling, the question of property rights. In referring to Kennedy's opinion, Allen asks, if marriage is just a mode of organizing property rights in attendant duties and privileges, why couldn't gay couples be given access to those rights via another organizational form? For instance, civil unions. Good question. But she then immediately reminds us, but this would have been to permit the reemergence of a world of separate but equal, where there is no justification for the separate vehicles other than animus and discrimination. With his arguments about dignity, 
Kennedy reminds us that this is separate but equal is firmly closed off, and he does continue. Did you catch it? But this would have been to permit the reemergence of a world of separate but equal. And we know how well that worked out. In other words, it's the old us versus them mentality. Or, I'm special, because I hold to the traditional religious definition of marriage, and you don't. Which brings us to the important word in Alan's concluding thought, animus. I've written about the us versus them mentality a few times, and how it's woven into the Reich's agenda. Its importance was imparted on me via a Diane Benscotter TED Talk titled, How Cults Think, where she speaks of extreme religious batshittery as a brain virus, much like Dr. Daryl Ray in The God Virus. The most dangerous part of this is that it creates us and them, right and wrong, good and evil, and it makes anything possible, makes anything rationalizable. Ben Scotter expands on that idea in a blog post, where she talks further in regards to meme plexus, a group of memes which have been used to understand, in this case, the phenomena of religion. She states, this concept gives us a means to view from an evolutionary perspective how and why we have tended to clump together into groups with highly polarized ideologies. We can start to understand the pull to view the world from an us versus them perspective. And that, my dears, fits into the Reich's agenda, like a hand fits into a glove. Well, if you're not O.J. Simpson, that is. Now, let me explain. Two years ago, at the height of the Cliven Bundy vs. BML standoff, a writer for Truth Wins Out, Bruce Wilson, discovered, for lack of a better word, the money behind the Reich, an annual conference called The Gathering that gives away up to a billion dollars a year with much of the money given to Christian organizations, Alliance Defending Freedom, the World Congress of Families, Family Research Council, and American Family Association. The largest donor at this conference is the National Christian Foundation, which last year gave away $670 million to various right-wing causes. Now, unless you've been living under a rock, these are not only the main purveyors of hate here in the U.S. and abroad, specifically Uganda and Russia, but also the main driving forces behind all the faux religious liberty cases we have witnessed in recent years. The takeaway? And why I mention this, as Wayne Beeson also of two points out, it is critically important to understand that the main goal of these extreme Christian fundamentalist groups is to take over nations and turn them into theocracies. This includes the United States and helps explain why our politics are so polarized. Do you get it now? Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Oh. Uh, think, but fine. Oh. Think. What Wave and Beeson did is come up with a 10-point playbook that these homegrown Christian extremists use when they attempt to accomplish their frightening goals. You'll recognize this list, as I have mentioned it quite a few times before. One, find inflammatory wedge issues and scapegoats to divide people and force them to choose sides. Two, persuade people to join your righteous team in its efforts to purify society. Demand absolute loyalty and obedience to that team's leaders, even above allegiance to the state. Three, identify and cultivate key major donors to fund missions to reward their support back conservative economic policies. Four, create parallel infrastructures and institutions, i.e. private education, conferences, think tanks, and charities. Five, build an insular media cocoon to disseminate propaganda. This vast echo chamber is contemptuous, contradictory crap. These major institutions and kindle sign efforts to undermine influence and ultimately control. See the Seven Mountains Mandate Movement, Government, Education, Family, Religion, Entertainment, Business, and Media. Seven. Facilitate the decline of secular government by deliberately and persistently creating crises in confidence and eroding trust in venerable institutions. 8. 
oppose all gun control laws, and tacitly encourage local militias. So in the event of insurrection, fundamentalists are the most well-armed sector of society. 9. Constantly agitate and manufacture havoc, because theocracy can only be attained amid chaos. Without a functioning central government, the shadow infrastructure created by fundamentalists makes them the best situated to fill a vacuum, restore order at the price of liberty, and install the regime. And finally, number 10, export model abroad. Send influential emissaries and dedicated missionaries. Deploy basic services to create dependence and dispense money to acquire strategic local alliances while organizing key international gatherings and fostering opposition at the United Nations. Although this really doesn't apply to us here in the States, we have seen this with Russia and Uganda. So, I ask again, is Huckabee's use of this analogy, along with the rest of the Reich's cadre, incidental, based on just plain ignorance or stupidity? Or is he, in a not-so-underhanded sort of way, stating, I have this plan, you see, I really have no problem discriminating against a distinct class of people in order to carry this plan to fruition. You have to remember, the right does have a plan. It begins with a reformed interpretation of the Free Exercise Clause, or an outright repeal of the First Amendment. It continues with the abolition of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and then it ends with the implementation of dominionist ideology in order to govern by theocratic control. And you've heard me repeat that many, many, many times. So, you know that little side trip? Uh, well, I sort of fell into a rabbit hole. So, maybe a part three? And now, back to our discussion with David Rand of Atheist Free Thinkers. There we go. Um, David, I muted you for a minute. Your chair was a little loud there, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Oh, you're, you're still muted. There sure. we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, good job as usual, Beth. Um, that was very interesting. Sorry about the rabbit hole, but that tends to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot, a lot more mixed into it than people realize. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary, and and some of those um, tendrils are trying to reach up here. So um, the sooner we can make Harper go bye bye, the better, because he's bad. And, and, and if you all listened really, really carefully, the name of my blog is hidden in the, in that piece, mm -hmm. where I actually got the title "Havoc and Chaos" from uh, from, from the ten point plan. Excellent, excellent. Wow. Well, um, so, kneecabs. Um, so, there's the big kerfluffle about this woman who wanted to take her citizenship oath while wearing a kneecab, and I believe that's the story that you were thinking of, David, yes? yes. Can yes. you explain the, the difference between all the different headwear? Because I always get confused. I, I won't explain them all, but I can explain the two worst ones. The okay. worst of all is the burqa, which covers right. the entire body, body, even the eyes, with just sort of a grid over the eyes. You can't even see the eyes. And the second worst is the kneecap, which covers everything but the eyes. The eyes you can see, and the, the, the woman can see out the slot, the, the slit. And she, she okay. Can, those are the, the two. The head scarf, the the head scarf one? That's okay, the, thank you. Okay. The, there, are, there are other kinds of veils, the chador, the hijab, and others. But the two worst ones are the, are the burqa and knee the kneecap. Okay. okay, and those are okay. sometimes referred to as the full veil. Uh, yes. Okay. Because they cover everything except possibly the eyes. Yes. Okay. And uh, so this uh, woman uh, um, a, a, who she wanted to take her uh, citizenship um, oath while wearing the niqab, and uh, she was prevented by a ministerial directive passed by the current conservative government, and uh, she took it to court, and she won in federal court last uh, February, I believe. Uh, then the government appealed the decision in order, because they wanted to maintain the ban on the niqab, 
and uh, the woman won again. Uh, the decision just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, during the election campaign and I believe the government plans to appeal yet again to a higher court. This time I think it would go to the Supreme Court. It's created a great deal of controversy. Uh, the majority of Canadians oppose the idea of a woman covering her face and being able to take the citizenship oath. And the, the, the number, uh, the, the proportion of people opposing the niqab is even higher in Quebec. It's overwhelmingly against the idea of a person being able to keep their face covered while taking that. Um, in my opinion, uh, it should never have been allowed the wearing of such a such uh, such a uh, it's not just an article of clothing it's a political symbol she it should is. not have, she mm -hmm. should not have been allowed to wear that and so it's good that the government uh, is appealing this decision but unfortunately they have almost no chance of winning uh, because uh, in the citizenship act uh, it, there are rules that say that uh, you have to respect to the maximum the religious views of the person that you're swearing in and, and so uh, so it's, it's probably not going to work and and you make a great distinction there though because the and if somebody was arguing this properly i think it might it might actually work because you said something that stuck out to me was that the niqab is a political symbol okay. But yes, I'd like to expand on that a little bit, uh, if I could. It's 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 not just an article of clothing. It's a symbol uh, of Islam, but it's not a symbol of uh, mainstream Islam. It's a symbol of radical extremist fundamentalist Islam, and and uh, uh, this causes a number of problems. One thing, the I identifying it as a Muslim symbol only, it's as if all Muslims are thrown into the radical bag, and they're not. There are plenty of moderate Muslims. So. So the, the niqab has to be recognized as, as a symbol of radical fundamentalism. And not only that, is it a religious symbol, it's mainly a political symbol. It's the symbol of a political ideology. It is, it is to radical Islamism what the swastika was to the Nazis, in my opinion. That sounds very extreme uh, to say that, but uh, ultimately Islamism is, is an extremely dangerous ideology. And uh, and this the niqab is one of the extreme forms of the uh, of the of the veil. There are there are much uh, there are other forms of the veil that are much less uh, uh, blatant that are you know much less constricting. But this is one of the worst. What does uh, it when sorry. when you say that though? What what really stuck out for me is that the niqab is not mentioned in any Islamic text. It well, is. In, in the Quran, uh, no, there's nothing in the Quran. Apparently, it just talks about modesty. And so yes. the word modesty has been interpreted in various ways, and some people interpret it as veiling, but that's an interpretation. That's but there, inter are, there are traditions in Islam where the veil is, is considered to be the correct. Tradition, yes, veil, but, but there are other traditions that disagree. So. And it's, but it's not doctrinal, and that's what gets it for me, is that because you can point... Like, say, uh, a, a Jewish person, who, like a Hasidic Jew, you can point to the Bible where it specifically says, don't cut this, grow your beard, wear this, don't do this. It, it gets very, very spelled out. And like you said, be modest has this incredibly huge um, interpretation. So, you know, if, if a person looked in, in their religion and... and well, case in point, if they, um, I forget the name of it, but there's a religion that um, believes that uh, marijuana is a sacrament. So if Rock, they were... Uh, uh, Rockerian. But just to get back to the kneecap, it, it, it's a, it, the veiling and the modesty. Uh, there are other writings that are considered to be of some authority, the Hadiths in Islam. And in some of those writings, the veil is uh, is imposed, uh, and so uh, you know it's uh, there is some doctrinal support for it, but it's not in the Quran. You're right, but but uh, I understand that uh, apparently the veil or the, the the idea of modesty was especially for uh, 
um, Muslim women themselves who were like wives of, uh, uh, of true Muslims, whereas prostitutes were, f for example, and non-Muslims were not we're not supposed to wear the veil. In other words, the veil indicates a pure woman, a good woman, and a woman who does not wear the veil is a prostitute or a slut or a heretic or you know or an infidel. Uh, and and, and so, the, so the veil is a symbol of purity, female purity, which indicates that women who do not wear it are impure. That is yes. the meaning. Uh, Great. Uh, it's interesting because um, I, I don't know if you you're familiar with Alishba Zarmin. Um, that's um, Ali's wife, and she and I were talking about this uh, oh ages ago. And she's a bit of a Islamic historian. She likes to to study Islamic history, and she, uh, we've been meaning to get together and and bring her back on the show. And she told me that. Before, in earlier history, it was actually the absolute opposite, that the prostitutes were required to be veiled because they didn't want these these fallen women being seen when they had to go to the market or, or something like that. You could sort of go, oh, it's a prostitute in a veil. I don't want to look at that. And it was the, the pure women who were not veiled. Now, I'm not sure of the timeline of that, but th that's the discussion that, that Elishba and I had a while back. So I found well, that, that, that kind of kind of falls into, uh, there's a meme going around, and it shows uh, 1972 Afghan compared to now, and in 70, yeah. and this is where it's like the switching of the, the cultural timeline, so to speak. In 72, they were in, basically, they looked like everyday Americans would. But then, you know, the, the, I guess, civil war, for lack of a better word, occurred, and then uh, now everybody's in burqas or It's whatnot. because of the growth of the, uh, of, the, right. of the Islamist ideology, where the, yeah. uh, the fundamentalists have taken power in several countries or have much greater influence, and they've, their, their program is to impose the mm -hmm. veil as much as possible and that's what they're trying to do slowly in North America that's what they're doing slowly in Canada the the this uh, a woman wearing a veil at the citizenship period, uh, ceremony it, it's like the beginning of uh, trying to make the veil like normal and acceptable and to and to have more and more of them in the public uh, in the public uh, sphere uh, so that it becomes accepted and uh, and normal and uh, it's now when we should uh, try to stop it. Uh, I think that I want to talk about the uh, the attitude of the other two uh, politi major political parties. Absolutely. Um, uh, I mentioned that the federal government, uh, that is the the conservative party currently in power, has appealed the decision because they're in favor of the ban. Uh, but the other two parties um, are opposed to banning the NECAB and they want to allow it and they're like, they want to leave it completely open. Uh, this position is uh, extremely retrograde, it's a very bad decision and what it does in fact, in, in addition to adding uh, strength to the Islamist program, it also strengthens paradoxically the, the uh, votes for the Conservative Party because Canadians massively oppose this uh, the NECAB, and and there's a lot of Canadians who would not otherwise vote for the Conservatives who just might do so because it's only the Conservatives who've taken any any steps against the wearing of the NECAB in in these in these uh, public ceremonies, and and so by by opposing uh, by opposing the ban on the NECAB, they've strengthened not only the Islamist fundamentalists, but they're also strengthening indirectly the Christian fundamentalists by, by helping to get the Conservative Party re-elected. Yeah, I know, it sucks. And, and it's, another thing that springs to mind, um, there was a video I had was watching the other day. Um, I'm in a, a, well, a few debate groups on Facebook, but this is one like multi, multi flavors of religion ver with several different flavors of secularism and somebody had posted a video where um, there were women wearing niqabs um, and I think it might have even been in a Toronto and they were talking about how it was their choice and you know it wasn't a bad thing blah 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 
And, and it was, you know, the one woman was like, well, it helps me to be a better Muslim because I'm, I'm focused, or I, I'm, you know, it makes me focus more on Islam, whatever. But the, the one thing that nobody said was, my religion tells me I have to do this. Every one of them said, I chose to do this because in, in so many words, I wanted to be more fundamental. And it had it wasn't like a, you know if you're if you're a, a practicing Jew most men would wear a yarmulke and and that's just how it goes but they're practically saying we don't have to do this we want to do this well if they choose to do it they can also uh, very easily uh, obey a simple uh, rule that you take it off during uh, certain in certain situations if they exactly. if they've chosen to wear it they can also choose to respect the law of the land and if there's a law that says no kneecaps during certain official ceremonies then they can take it off and, and, if, uh, and if they don't if they refuse to they want privileges for their, for their religion that other people don't have that's right, because I want to bet, what do you want to bet, that if I convince Beth to move up here permanently and she goes to a ceremony wearing a colander on her head, somebody's going to have a problem with that. Why are you wearing a kitchen utensil on your head? You're mocking the ceremony, and, and they're going to have a stink. It's like, nope, this is my religious headgear, damn it, and I'm going to, or, or show up with a pirate patch on, right? You know, I, I'm wearing a beard and a patch because that's religious attire, and and I get to do that. Thanks. Like yes. they would have a cow, and yet it's okay for somebody to to show up there with their face covered, and and make that type of a of a political statement. It's and I've made this point before about all religious clothing, um, because a lot of people are like, well, that's just you know they're following their religion. Yes, and why does every single religion that has a fundamentalist side to it prescribe what an adherent wears? It's a public statement of, I know the right God and you don't, and I'm going to heaven and you're not. That's it's a form of advertising. It's a, it's a form of uh, marketing of their belief system. And, uh, and that such marketing has no place uh, in, in the public uh, in the public service. Uh, it has no place in for employees certainly. No. And the worst the worst forms of it where they have the face is covered and you have trouble even seeing the, the person, the, then it should be forbidden for even clients of public services. Absolutely. I, I like I said I went to college last year. And it had been 20 years to the year since I had been in school. And I found it really unsettling to be walking the halls of the school and these women walking around in knee cobs. And my first thought is, I don't know who the hell is under that thing. Exactly. And, and that's why even ISIS employs squadrons of women in the whole burqa, but their job is to check other women under the burqa to make sure it's a woman under there and not some infiltrator into the camp. Yeah, it's a security problem. But it's it's uh, even beyond the security question. It's a wall that separates the woman. Off. It's a wall that separates the person who wears it from the rest of society, and and it's a it's a wall that says I am not part of this society. I am. Uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm special and different. I'm better the whole, than. It's the whole us versus them. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's yes. that whole, and, it, and it's not just Christianity that 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 it's part of. I don't know <clears throat> Islam as well as Deb does, but from what little I do know of the various the us them thing is in all of them. Yes. That exceptionalism is in every single religion, including Buddhism. Yes, it is. A lot is. of people say, "Well, well, Buddhism uh, actually, Buddhism, Buddhism, if you get to the root of it, is a very violent religion. Mm -hmm. They're That's no right. better than than anybody else." That's right, and and it's oh, not yeah. just saying that I'm I'm apart from this society. It's 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 an advertisement of I'm better than everybody else. Yes. Like I, I've got the right answer. I'm better than you, and I, I'm too good to even be sullied by being visible in your society. 
and and that's, some that's of the what women, means, yes yeah and that's mm -hmm. what some of the women were saying even they were like well we're just like you and we go, we go to boutiques and buy the cool clothes but that's that's reserved and that's not for everybody to see that's only for certain people to see and i'm like wow that's pretty damn hoity toity of you isn't it like so we're not good enough to see you in public like wow <laughs> You know, it, it, well, it's, it, it, it's like he was saying, it's the purity culture. And yeah. you know how big that here is in the States, especially when you get into the whole patriarchy and the dominionists and the quiverful movements. I, yeah. I find that kind of interesting, that, that parallel. I'm going to have to look that up now. Yeah, purity <laughs> is a major theme of, uh, of uh, many religions, uh, probably yeah. especially the monotheisms, but... Uh, I, I, I find actually the monotheisms to be worse than the polytheisms, but, I, I but would, Hindu, nevertheless, Hinduism is bad enough in spite of the fact that they got more than one god. <laughs> uh, I, but, I, uh, I, I, I have a less of a beef with polytheism than monotheism. I'm with you there 100%. Yeah, monotheism is the totalitarianism of theism. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, one it's single monotheism. dictator god up in the sky. Our, his way or the highway, and that's right. it. Yeah. yeah. And you know what that means if you're not with his way. It's, you know, you're going to get burnt at the stake or hung or beheaded or whatever the hell else it is. And, and what you were saying, too, about it being a matter of respecting our culture, this is what pisses me off the most out of this, is if any of these Islamic countries, if you were to go to their country... And if I was dressed like this, with, you know, cleavage, they would ha I would be arrested, I could be beaten, who knows, yes. because I disrespected their laws. But it's a well, look at the for them to come to whatever country and be like, oh, well, you have to, you have to respect our laws. Uh, yeah, I know it's your country, but tough titty, we're religious, you better respect us. And that burns my ass more than anything. Well, what they, they're using a very intelligent, the Islamists have a very intelligent uh, uh, strategy. They use our laws, which guarantee certain freedoms, they use them against us. In other yes. words, uh, they interpret, uh, they, they, they turn wearing of the niqab into a right. I mean, it's bad enough that, it, that such clothing would be allowed in a citizenship uh, uh, ceremony, but they consider it a right like we, that has to be granted, and they use uh, you know, charters of rights and freedoms and our principles of human rights to claim, uh, to claim this privilege for themselves as if it were a right. Well, case in point, do you remember back in 2003? I don't know. Did you ever live in Ontario much? Yes. Yes, I was born in Ontario. I was raised there. Okay. I kind of, well, you didn't sound very Quebecois, so I wasn't No, sure. I'm, not, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not from here originally, but I've lived here for many years. Um, in 2003, um, back at, before that, I think it was in like 1990-ish, um, Ontario enacted a law that the gist of it was... Um, a group, and it was aimed at the Aboriginal, the First Nations um, communities, really, was that their um, tribunals could adjudicate certain um, nonviolent um, breaches of the criminal code, and that they could go through and, and do, um, um, I, I forget what they call them, but their, their you know, seating of elders where they... they look at the, the issue when they pronounce judgment within their own community. And that had been enacted in the spirit of giving a bit of autonomy to the First Nations people. And in 2003, some Islamists found out about this, and they tried to use it as a vehicle to institute Sharia law in Ontario. Did you? Did you yes, I remember that, and fortunately they failed. Yes, and, and, and um, I remember that McGinty was he the uh, premier? Walter McGinty, yes, I think so. Yes. Yeah. And and but what he had to do in order to prevent this was repeal the damn law, 
because they actually had a leg to stand on the way it was written because of course when it was written nobody was thinking about Sharia they were trying to to give autonomy to First Nations people and, and well, that was, I, I think it also covered uh, uh, Jewish tribunals as well and, and Catholics I believe too I believe the Catholics were in on it which is why the Islamists figured well what's good for them hey we're religious give us Sharia well, well, that's that's why it's important to have to have uh, to to avoid any kind of religious privilege because if there is any, the Islamists will try to grab it. And absolutely, it. and and who's to say? I mean, we're lucky that the the other Abrahamics in Canada are reasonably well, for lack of a better term, well behaved. They they don't tend to try and and run roughshod over everybody in that. He's being that same way because even though the the Jewish um, folks and the Catholics still had they had access to that law, you didn't see them, you know, trying to enact, you know, religious based fundamentalism. But the Islamists came through and were like, "Woohoo, bonanza!" Well, and, I, I think I think the reason that, for example, that the Catholics uh, may look less dangerous is because. Uh, we have we that is those of us who support secularism have won battles in the past that yes. have been fought very hard. Not not we personally, but I mean previous generations, our our ancestors fought hard against the the established Christian churches, the Catholic Church and the others, to to uh, move towards secularism. And uh, that kind of movement has has not happened as much in, in the Muslim world. Uh, the Muslim world is, you know, the 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 mentality of uh, of, uh, of theocracy is still much stronger, and secularism has not made the same progress. And so it's not that the Catholics are better behaved; it's just that they've been put in their place <laughs> in the past <laughs> by us fighting against them. They would love to make a return. <laughs> like I'm sure that the current pope would love to make a return. He he's a very good marketer, and he looks uh, he comes yeah. across as being warm and fuzzy, but really it's just all a marketing ploy. I was gonna say, what since you mentioned him, what's your take on the guy? But so you think he's the PR pope? Yeah. Well, I mean, he's the, he's the kind of leader who is effective in periods when when the church is uh, losing power and it can't afford to look uh, too arrogant and uh, it can't afford to look like it's grabbing for power. It has to play the game of appearing nice and tolerant and open-minded. And Fran, Fran, the current pope does it does this very well. And a lot of people are fooled by him. I think they're they very are. foolish to be fooled by him. I think they're, well, very foolish uh, because uh, clearly he's just the same as all the others. He's just a uh, better marketer. He's a better I, propagandist. I agree with you 100%. He's, he's paying lip service to the issues that he knows are, are forefront in in. Society's consciousness right now, but That's without giving an inch on the essential uh, elements of dogma, right. like for example, uh, reproductive rights for women, you're not going to see him coming out in favor of that. Oh uh, hell no! I mean, if you want to eliminate world poverty, then uh, we need to women need to have reproductive control of their own bodies. That's how you fight poverty, but they're not going to do that. But but. Uh, People who are not poor and might be educated aren't gonna think they need Jesus anytime soon, are they? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, when, when people are not poor, uh, they religion uh, religion becomes that is religion feeds on poverty, and so if, uh, if poverty were reduced, there'd be less of a market for religion. Absolutely, and, and um, even Mother Teresa is a good example of it, it was a different type of poverty, but the idea of the suffering, and that's why they glom on to the whole suffering crap, is because people who are happy don't spend a lot of time thinking about maybe there's something better after this life. People who are miserable and poor and sick and suffering, and they're the ones that are like, you know, oh, heaven? Yes, I, I'll do whatever I can, sign me up, I, I want that, because this life sucks. 
and they or, or people who who live uh, through a great deal of injustice. They they yes. they hope for a second life where the where justice will be rendered to those who have suffered in this life, and, and That's uh, right. those who have treated them poorly will be, finally get punished in the in the afterlife. Yes, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice dream, but it's only a dream. It's yeah, it's it's total bullshit, and the the you know the um, churches have been spending centuries honing their their shtick on how to exploit that, and like I mean, if you look at the history of the Catholic Church, they're they're absolute experts at it for centuries. And uh, I'm I'm glad that they're they're losing out to the point that they're scrambling to find themselves a good PR guy. But you know it it is sad that people are being fooled by him because he's nothing new at all. He's just a a prettier package. Yeah. Yeah. He's just a, an effective uh, spokesperson. Absolutely. Although I laughed at the whole like, no, I didn't endorse Kim Davis. No, ah, thing. Yeah, that that's kind of amusing to me. <laughs> yeah, that that was uh, strange. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what went on there yet. But. Yeah. Well, but basically, what they're saying is, yes, is Kim Davis's team is saying, oh yeah, the Pope endorsed me. Yada yada yada. Well, coming from the Vatican. He's like, no, I met her in a line of, of people. What little I've read about it, it sounds like that the embassy head here in the United States set up the meeting. Kim Davis was included. There was a line of 12 to 15 other individuals. No, the Pope did not. According to him, the Pope did not meet with her privately. The only person he met with privately besides family was a former student of his who happens to be gay. Well, uh, and so the Vatican is saying no, the Pope did not meet privately with her. Liberty Council is saying yes, he did. I would have a tendency in this case to believe the Pope before I would believe anything that came out of the mouth of Matthew Stabler. Well, uh, okay, the Pope did not therefore endorse uh, her directly in that way. However, he did nevertheless make statements endorsing what she did without naming her. He, yeah, he, the he called for conscientious being... objection to laws that are incompatible with Catholic doctrine. And That's so he, he, he implicitly endorsed what she did without naming her. Yeah. Well, well I, the, I, I, the problem is, is he did, I'm not, who said, he did not say, what the Liberty Council is specifically saying is that the Pope wanted to meet with her. No, she was part of a lineup and this was not set up specifically by the Vatican, it was set up by the embassy, the Vatican <laughs> embassy. But it, it, it put her in way. front of him. They, they basically put her in front of him and he kind of went, oh, hi, and, and that, oh, I'm at the Pope and he... Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, in my opinion, the... Whether it's the Vatican itself that fucked up, whether it's the embassy that fucked up, Kim Davis never should have been there. It's plain and simple. Well, I'm sure she's considered uh, beneath the Pope. <laughs> oh, not according to some people because, and this is a real funny thing, first of all, she is an apostolic Christian. In other words, she does not believe in a trinity. So the fact that Matthew St that Matthew Staver is even representing her tells you that this is cash cow because he is an evangelical Christian who does believe in the Trinity as does the Catholic Church. Yeah, so figure that all out. So and she like, is a non-trinitarian. Yeah, yeah, she is a non-trinitarian. Oh, what a heretic! Did <laughs> <laughs> she be crucified or something? <laughs> yeah, so. So, and also, go ahead, Deb, sorry. <laughs> Would she not think that the Pope was this, like, head of this abomination church? Yes, like, yes, yes. And so does Matthew Staver. Yeah. Those in the, in the theocratic movement actually, well, it goes, just like when they supported Robney. Just before Robney got uh, the nomination for the... Uh, Republican to run uh, Franklin Graham's group well 
they actually had on their website that Mormonism is a cult. When he was nominated as Republican run for the president, that statement was removed from their web page. Oh, Same thing with Catholicism. Some of your heavy hitters that are more evangelical and more fundamentalist actually consider the Catholic Church a pagan organization. The so Whore of Babylon. Yes, the Whore of Babylon. Okay. Kim Davis will take that even one step further. I mean, you got three different types of Christians. Who, well, there's more than three. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that the three primaries, you got Matt Savory, you got Kim Davis, and you got the Pope. Theologically, none of them agree, and they all consider each other heretics. Yeah. So 300 years ago, they'd be trying to, like, burn each other at the stake. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. unfortunately for, for Kim and what's-his-face, the Pope would have won that one 300 and 400 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And he wouldn't have bothered smiling uh, at the time as much as no. he does today. He wouldn't have. Uh, he wouldn't have bothered with the marketing, uh, with the, no, you know, the, the image was, stuff. That was Iron Fist days. Burn him. Yes. yes. Burn him and let God sort him out later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just try to get him to confess before they get crispy. <laughs> that that was the way to do it back then. Yes. And it was even. Um, the mentality was that you were actually doing them a favor by burning them at the stake because fire was a purifier. And yep. they had a, a better chance of actually making it to heaven if you burnt them. So in other words, you were you were working in favor of their eternal soul. You were yep. act, It was an act of love that you were uh, performing. Yes. 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 Uh, because you were helping to, to improve the chances of their eternal soul going to heaven. Yes. That's right. And see, and if you could torture a confession out of them first, even bonus marks, man, they're almost certain to get into heaven. As long as they confess. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and sadly, that's the mentality be, behind all the, uh, well, Stephen L. Anderson is the one I like to harp on the most with the whole stone the gaze things, and now it's, you know, with the uh, people fighting for uh, uh, anti abortion, is that, you know, they see the you know, killing, like, you know, with the, the Tiller murder, they see that that killing was basically the, the purification by fire. That's the mentality they use to justify their, their did you say, violence. Say, did you say that there are Christians who want to stone gays? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, they, they really are just like Islamists then, aren't they? Oh, yeah. they, they Sharia, uh, uh, now granted, Stephen L. Anderson is a fucking moron, but it's also coming from Gordon Klingenschmidt, although he hasn't come quite out and said to actually. But yeah, we have we have a congressman in Colorado who has the same mindset. Gordon Klingenschmidt, also known as Dr. Chaps. Oh yeah, the Sharia is already here in the form of uh, the Christian, Christian variant of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Because uh, Bethel blog about that on occasion where, you know, oh, this month so-and-so said stone all of us gay people. Yeah, I, 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 what did I go for about seven months straight, I think, where at least once a week I was posting where some pulpit preacher man or woman uh, basically were basically saying stone the gays, kill the gays. Jeez. And that's the idea, is that by doing so, you're doing them a favor. Yeah. Now, he, he is a, a very, very strict King James, 1611 King James only preacher, but uh, he's also part of the Quiverful movement. I mean, he, he's an extreme case, but just with any, any, any of the extremum, extremism, it's, become, it's slowly becoming the norm. Yeah. Because it, it, he actually is part of what's called the shepherding movement, and he is teaching other ministers the same fucking crap. And not even, I think it was like a month or so after I posted about that, one of his, quote, students came out and said the exact same thing. It's like, oh, jeez. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, so what do these, these Christian uh, fanatics, what do they think of Islam? Oh, it's... Did, did you, what's the word I'm looking for, Deb? It's uh, demonic. Demonic. Um, yeah, 
yeah, demonic, well, satanic. Uh, you go to some of the uh, debate groups, uh, and, and it's like, oh, you know, Islam is demonic. They're terrorists. Uh, they're, they're, you know, Allah is a fake god, and yeah, it's just they're, yeah, kind of okay, like the old. That's, that's what I would expect, but. Do you think that, uh, I have another question, do you think that in the United States when there is prejudice against Muslims, do you think that comes mainly from the fanatical Christians? Or oh yeah, it's coming directly from the fanatical Christians. And that they're the main source of prejudice against Muslims? Yeah, well see what's happening is, uh, uh, you got Mike Huckabee, like our, our current Republican presidential candidate, so I'll just say that. Primarily, our members uh, are following these doctrines being preached from the church, and what they're doing is you have Joe Blow preaching this, and Joe Blow's congregant is jo uh, Mike Huckabee. Mike Huckabee is a political figure running for president, so it's giving legitimacy to these views, and it's just climbing up the ladder. So, me, okay, I'm watching, oh, well, Mike Huckabee believes that, and Mike Huckabee's a politician, and he's a good Christian man, therefore, I believe what Mike Huckabee believes. People don't even know why they're spouting the bullshit. They're, bull they're spouting because they don't understand it. It's just, it's apathy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, mean, per I mean, personally, for me, I think religion needs to be wiped off the face of the planet. The reality, I know, is never going to happen, but... You, you got idiots, and this is why I think getting it out of the public sphere. If you want to be religious, fine. Do it in your home, do it in your church, and leave it at that. Exactly. Satan, you know. Yes. But when you have politicians, whether they be local or state level politicians, you know, uh, on, on up, when you start having politicians spouting bullshit, that bullshit's going to keep climbing the ladder. And, it, and on the other hand, it takes one goofball preacher um, to say something like that and one nut job parishioner who goes, oh, I'm supposed to kill the gays. Okay, I'm going to get a gun and find me some gay people. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and that, regardfully, that has happened with the abortion. Uh, anybody that, uh, the, the, the Tiller case. Yeah. I mean, it was a fanatical you know, I'll say lone wolf. I don't remember the whole backstory. He literally took what he was being, I'll say, taught, whether it be through the uh, anti-abortion group or whether it was being preached at it, and went and shot this. Uh, remember too, Michelle Palin, when she was uh, running for Beep, she actually had on her website the target thing. Yes. That's, and uh, Jared Lahr decided to go ahead and take that out, and Gabrielle Gifford got shot in the head, and other people were killed. That was a direct line of it being preached in the pulpit, mm -hmm. or being preached by a politician from the pulpit. And that, you know, I mean, people laugh at uh, Sarah Palin still, but she's very dangerous, even though she's not in power. Oh, I believe that. She, and, and like, uh, Michelle Bachman's another one. She's all, you know, she's in this movement as well. Even though she's uh, being quiet at the moment, although there was a little peep out of her the other day, she's just as dangerous. These people are dangerous. We, we sit here uh, and criticize Islam. It's the 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 extreme and I'm talking the extreme not your everyday progressive or liberal I mean Christians I'm talking your extreme theocratic want to rule the government wants to repeal the first amendment yep you know that those type of Christians I'm not talking about Joe Blow down the street <clears throat> so um we're coming up near the end of the show um David was there anything else you wanted to touch on before we start wrapping up well, I, I might mention this uh, this newly breaking story about this new tip line that the conservatives have uh, oh, uh, have uh, started up. It sounds really, really kind of ugly, but uh, um, the the barbaric uh, cultural practices uh, denunciation phone line that the conservative government has set up. It it sounds really awful, but. I think it's obvious that the reason it exists is it's uh, they're being opportunistic. 
and they're exploiting the fact that uh, that uh, the, they're garnering votes from Canadians who are disgusted by the the Liberal and, in, and New Democratic parties and their opposition to the ban on the NECAB and the Conservatives are gaining support because they have a ban, uh, they support the ban on the NECAB and so this is just an extension of it. They're, they're being further uh, further opportunistic and, it, and it, uh, it, it sounds really kind of poisonous. It does, but I'm thinking if they if they actually get this thing launched if I can like call every day and report Harper for um, that would be a good thing to report. Yes, uh, the, the I, I, barbaric uh, fanatic uh, report uh, on the barbaric fanatic named Harper. <laughs> like um, yeah, I heard the prime minister um, like told scientists that they can't publish their findings and oh, and I heard that the prime minister like you know went to church and. I I don't know if he's a young Earth creationist or not, but I would find out for that. I would indeed. <laughs> What's this phone line? Okay, so this is what Harper is proposing, that there is a tip line created so that you could call up and report your neighbor for having barbaric cultural practices. Things like uh, underage marriage or forced marriage or... Um... Female genital mutilation. Seriously? Yeah. Um... But you and know so well that once that thing gets going, my neighbor doesn't go to church. My neighbor's a Satanist. My neighbor sacrifices babies. You know, I, I, I don't think it's going to degenerate quite that far. But it, it, it sounds bad enough the way it is. And the, you know, I, I, I would blame, uh, I blame the uh, liberals and New Democratic Party for, for giving him this gift that he can do this. No, I agree. And, and the, the thing that bugged me about um, what Trudeau and, and our friend Dave in Ottawa pointed this out to me because I really didn't know a whole lot about Trudeau, uh, you know, like six, eight months ago. I didn't really know a whole lot about him. I just kind of thought, well, you know, he's a liberal. He can't be a, too horrible, you know, maybe a bit of corruption. But, I, you know, our friend Dave pointed out that he's been going around to all of these mosques and attending their services all the time and I'm like okay there's one thing to say I appreciate that you're a Muslim and that I want to make sure that you're able to practice your religion as you see fit and, and all of that but if you as a political leader are going to mosque and mosque and mosque and mosque you're you're sending a completely different message than I support you as a Canadian you're uh. saying Yes, you're right. That is that is sending a bad message, and I'm sure that Thomas Polcair does exactly the same thing. I don't know about that. Now, our friend Dave is very, he's a big NDP supporter, and he's hes sort of been needling at me, and I'm like, dude, I don't know, but um, if Mulcair was doing it, it would have to be pretty... Um, underground because if our friend Dave found out about it he would ditch Mulcair too he's that passionate about it so no but uh, Mulcair and Trudeau have the same multiculturalist mentality where they try to uh, the clientelism they try to uh, seduce uh, religious communities or ethnic communities in order to get votes yeah. If, if Trudeau was going around and hanging out in Hindu temples and, um, you know, synagogues or, you know, go find the local Rastas and smoke a joint with them or, you know, something like that, okay, fine, you're trying to cover your bases. But he's making a point of heading to all of these damn mosques, and that's a completely different message. You're saying he's concentrated more on, on mosques than on uh, other temples, other religions. Yeah, yeah. As far as I know, um, now I'd have to go and, and look it up, but um, this is just what my friend Dave was showing me. Um, he showed me three or four different news stories of, of uh, Trudeau going to services at various mosques. Around, I think it was mainly around Ottawa. This was before um, the election was called, like, um, in the in the spring or the winter even but it was concerning to me because he was already the leader of the party at that point and everybody yes. knew that there was going to be an election relatively soon so to me that that was very suspect I didn't like that I understand but uh, I, I think the I think that the other leaders do it as well oh, yeah. uh, 
uh, certainly more care. Yeah, it just you know I had kind of thought because I I'm one of these people that I never used to get too embroiled in what was going on until I had you know the elections coming, and and Dave kind of kicked me in the ass and said no you need to know all the time and he's right I should. Um, so at the time I wasn't paying that close of attention and I kind of thought oh, you know Trudeau might be a pretty decent guy you know he's he's young and brash and maybe he's you know fresh blood but then that kind of went, hmm, nope, you're just like all the rest of them. Isn't that great? <laughs> but, you know, I guess politicians a politician. There's not much much variety in them when it comes right down to it. Right. We should start wrapping things up. So, um, Beth, um, we'll start off if you want to tell everybody where they can find you. I know they probably already know, but there might be somebody <laughs> that... That doesn't know, so uh, if you want to call Well, we, we might have a few new listeners out there that haven't heard me rant and rave on, on uh, Theocracy, but the easiest way to find me is on Twitter. It's at, at Dune9998. That does collect, uh, connect to my Facebook as well as my blog, which is Havoc and Chaos, um, and that is on blogger.com. Just type in Havoc and Chaos. It should pop right up. And the alternative is Facebook, uh, Beth A. Hambridge. Use the A or you'll get my, my vanilla account, which I very rarely use. <laughs> so that's the, the easiest way. And I, I try to publish stuff. Uh, uh, mostly I aggregate news stories, but every now and then there's one that hits me that I write about or babble about. So. Or there's a rabbit hole. Yeah, that the, this today's was a rabbit hole because that's not what I had planned on <laughs> talking about. It's all right, it's all right. Yeah. So. Okay, and David, thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed yeah. it. And I love it a lot. Thank you for inviting me, and I would encourage uh, our listeners to check out our website, atheology.ca. That's atheology.ca. We and have blogs and various articles and links to our Facebook page and to our, our YouTube uh, channel and various other things. Excellent. Various yeah, other there's, there's definitely some good stuff on there, so definitely check that out. And um, if you look at the, I believe it's on the non-conferences um, uh, Facebook page. If you check out the non-conferences Facebook page, you should be able to find links to the blasphemy panel from the non-conference that was held in August. And, and you can find that on our site as well. Yes. Okay, excellent, excellent. Because that, that was a really good discussion, and I, I highly recommend that everybody check that out as well. Um, you know, it's, it's a really important topic, and I think that we, uh, we need to keep a focus on that as well as, um, you know, just general... Um, religious issues, but the blasphemy stuff I think is really topical right now and I think it's something that needs to be addressed. And, and yes. as Eric said, as Eric said, you know, Iceland, man, Iceland could get yes. rid of blasphemy law. What the hell is wrong with us, right? Yes, Canada needs to do the same as Iceland did. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, again, um, thank you, David. We had a, a wonderful time. And I will plug my stuff for a moment. Um, of course, there's the uh, the new show, relatively new. We got four episodes out now. Atheist Apocalypse, atheistapocalypse.com, or um, at AA Podcast Show is our Twitter. Uh, we will be, I think, next week is uh, episode five coming out. Um, there's going to be at least one new character in that um, show, so we'll be looking forward to that. <laughs> Um, yeah, best giggling. <laughs> um, we are, are working hard at new episodes, um, and and uh, the creator Paul is actually writing season two already. So you know, there's lots of great stuff coming down down the pipe for that. And um, we actually were on our friend Dave in Ottawa's podcast, um, the cast of Atheist Apocalypse, and that's the Atheist Podcast, which is A for Canadian, Atheist Podcast. So uh, check those guys out. 
there's our friend Dave from Ottawa and our other friend our other other friend Dave um, from Ontario other part of Ontario who goes by Big Black Gay Dave um, he does a great newscast on the show so uh, that's fun and our, our friends uh, in the other part of Pennsylvania the Maleys are uh, also hosts on the show so that's the atheist podcast and the, ho the cast of Atheist Apocalypse was on there on the last episode so you can check us out there too and, and check out the guys anyway because uh, they do they do a nice little show over there as well and I think I think of course, uh, holy crap on uh, Saturday slash Sunday morning at midnight. And Beth was on the last episode with us, so that was fun. And uh, we don't know what we're talking about this week, but there'll be uh, anywhere from five to eight of us. So come check us out with Shuj and Trouble at Holy Crap the Vlogcast. And that's on YouTube. And Beth, am I forgetting anything? I think I got it. I think he got everything. <laughs> oh, oh, you forgot my secular savior. Oh yes, and my secular savior dot com um, at my secular savior, and of course we have uh, Beyond the Trailer Park at Beyond TT Park, and Beyond the Trailer Park at gmail dot com, and our Patreon uh, Patreon dot com forward slash Beyond the Trailer Park if you like to support us. So um, again, thanks to David, and we'll be back next week. Next week, we're going to be talking to Mr. Zach, Zach Law of the Zach Relige Show. Um, and I am the most prolific guest on the Zach Relige Show. I've been on three times, so I thought mm, maybe I should have Zach on. That'd probably be a good idea. So <laughs> Zach is going to come and hang out with us next week, and uh, we're going to find out what it's like to uh, be an atheist blogcaster in Atlanta and um, he can talk about his kittens, which are adorable, and all of that fuss. And beer, he likes his beer. So I'm sure there'll be some beer talk. So that's next week, Zach from the Zach Relige, um, I guess, video podcast. So until next week, as always, I will leave us with our friend Foda's uh, Humanist Creed, and we will see you next week. I know the truth and power of reason and of rational thinking, and I will use them to my advantage. I know the truth and power of educating myself and of expanding my intellectual boundaries, and I will educate myself. I know the truth and power of vanquishing ignorance, and I will do so whenever the opportunity presents itself. I know the truth and power of morality without supervision, of true and accurate righteousness. I know the truth and power of obliterating tyranny, both intellectual, emotional, or philosophical, and will work toward that goal whenever and however possible. I know the truth and power of human ingenuity. I know the truth and power of human compassion, and I will be mindful of the welfare of others. I know the truth and power of equality and fairness for all living things. I know the truth and power of the importance of our families, our friends, and our fellow men and women. I know the truth and power of human stewardship of our lands, our waters, and our skies. And I will try to act to preserve our environment. I know the truth and power of the sciences of mathematics, of physics, and of chemistry and of the important role of these disciplines in understanding the workings of this cosmos. I know the truth and power of the rejection of all notions or beliefs that reside in the supernatural or the superstitious, and of those notions or beliefs that we are not supposed to be able to explain. And I know that these rejections are necessary for humankind's survival. I am a human being with a free mind, liberated from irrational influence and from unreasonable dogma.